Good afternoon, everybody. It is 5 p.m. and I am your host, Tina Brock, and you have joined us for Into the Absurd, which is, of course, our weekly existential conversation where we dig into the lives and the hearts and the spirits and the minds of people doing very interesting work in the community. On today's show, John Heon and David McKnight of the Philadelphia Avant-Garde Studies Consortium. We're going to talk to them about their un upcoming symposium on December 4th at Absurdum. And we're going to get into some details about special projects and interests of David and John. If you're joining us on Zoom, thank you for being here. Please put your questions for David and John in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to them. I want to thank Erica Holscher and Bob Schmidt for doing a very yeoman work at front of house and getting you all served and getting you in. You can put your orders in and <laughs> we'll see what we can get to you this afternoon virtually in the ways of uh, beverages and uh, good eats. So that's that's on the table for us today. And if you're coming on on Facebook as well, uh, send your comments and your questions. And you can always head over to YouTube and find past episodes. This is where we're going to be Saturdays at 5 p.m. And thank you for joining us on today's show, as I said. John Heon and David McKnight, they are co-directors and founders of, along with Katie Price, the back in 2014, the Philadelphia Avant-Garde Studies Consortium, and they are dedicated to illuminating the works and studies and doing all kinds of um, activity and attention to something they care very deeply about. So why don't we do this? Let's bring John Heon and David McKnight to the table right now and learn more about. There I see John. Hello, everyone. There we go. Getting getting David in as well. Welcome, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thanks, uh, thank you so much for being here. I, I want to uh, start with the Avant-Garde Studies Consortium and how you both um, decided that Avant-Garde needed concentrated attention in Philadelphia. And, and John, I'll start with you. Well, um, there's a certain amount of serendipity that came into play, maybe predictable serendipity, you might say. Um, I've been a, an Alfred Jarry obsessive, you know, for decades. And um, one of the faculty in the Penn English department where I did my PhD, Jean-Michel Rabaté, put me in touch with Katie Price, who was currently finishing her PhD there. And uh, she also is obsessed with Jari, even has a dog named Jari. And um, after that, we started just brainstorming. And before we knew it, we had dozens and dozens of people in the Philadelphia area, faculty, artists, collectors, etc. some people in New York and DC as well, who wanted to get involved in an effort to develop, uh, first of all, avant-garde studies as a whole, but secondly, Jari's work. And then we met Emily Bruton and learned about Jim Bruton's work. And he, of course, was um, heavily involved with the um, pataphysics of the 1960s. He was a Philadelphia artist and um, incredibly innovative, um, a really original vision. And so Emily was sort of the final and perfect addition to that team of pataphysicians. And so in 2014, we began to put together ideas for what we might do. We got David you know, involved right away as well through the Rare Books uh, collection. And there were so many potential ways in which we could work together. We began by doing a program um, called uh, Philadelphia a la Pataphysique. And that was a week long series of events, performances, lectures, and an exhibition of Jim Bruton's works that was shown at the Slot Foundation. Um, all of that happened in 2014. And that was sort of our genesis story. And David, you might wanna add things here that I left out. Oh, what I would add, uh, John uh, and Tina, is that um, and this, this has to do with our broader vision for what, uh, what, what PASC is all about, is the, the, the relationship between um, a community interested in a particular um, topic like the avant-garde and the relationship with an institution, a collecting institution. So uh, one, of our, uh, one of our visions and motives is to uh, archive the experience, whether it is historical or in the present. And we're particularly focused on a, 
on a trajectory of looking at the avant-garde in Philadelphia from perhaps its tentative origins uh, at the beginning of the 20th century into the present. So we're a kind of past, present, and future uh, organization. And uh, we have, so we're building this connection between an institution and a group of interested individuals who are exploring either through the historical lens or through practice uh, evidence of the avant-garde in Philadelphia in particular. I also say that we're kind of inspired when we formed this group in 2014. Uh, I had met John in 2013 as we they were beginning to plan uh, the uh, the pataphysics symposium. And it just so happened that we had opened up the beautiful Kislak Center on the sixth floor of the Van Pelt Library. And it was that space that enabled us to provide a venue for exploring the avant-garde. So um, just with a note, looking forward to our upcoming um, symposium, it will be virtual, but in essence, it's this again, relationship between the institution and the group. So I think that's very important. Was, what surprised you most out of the, the initial, the, pata, the, pata, the, the first event? What, what did it surprise you? The result, the attention, the excitement, the enthusiasm? Well, I would say yeah. I'm going to let John speak, but I would just say very briefly that I think it was a fantastic. It was an it was a moment in time, 2014. Mm -hmm. um, that the shape of uh, the faculty, art history faculty at Penn and other interested um, uh, avant garde explorers, uh, particularly at Penn, but not excluding other institutions. There was a there was a kind of a moment there that has dissipated in some to some extent in terms of academic connections, but we carry on. You I just yeah. wanna say, well, oh, go ahead, John. Well, I, I was gonna say that um, part of what struck me in 2014 that really amazed me was that there were so many connections that just immediately materialized and um, people in different fields, uh, Michael Taylor, you know, former um, head of modern art at the PMA and now in Virginia, um, he, of course, has been a Duchampian all of his life and, and through Duchamp, uh, a pataphysician as well. So he came on board right away and he and I had been talking about um, pataphysics via Nauman and Duchamp ever since he started working on the Nauman uh, uh, Venice Biennale show. Yeah, 2008, 2009, we were talking about that. So Michael and I, and we've known each other for a very long time, but Michael was immediately on board with the idea of creating this group and he jumped right in. Charles Bernstein, um, whom I mentioned br briefly before, um, award-winning poet, just won the Bollingen Prize, um, part mm -hmm. of the language poets movement, um, Bob Perlman, others. Everybody started saying, wow, you're into pataphysics too. And then uh, yeah. Turns out, I don't know if you know DJ Spooky, but he's in, into pataphysics as well. He ended up um, participating in the pataphysical uh, events that week in 2014 uh, via the internet from Korea, where he was doing some work at the time. And, you know, so we're, we're very local in certain ways. It's a very, um, I think that mm. Duchamp, Nauman, uh, Bruton, varying levels of fame among the visual artists, but connections that go through very powerfully. That's one part of it, the visual arts. Then there's the language side via poetry, especially. The poets are crucial to this. And Katie Price is responsible for bringing most of the, the poets into the group. And with those two groups, I think that was really, you know, what gave us both a very local and a very national and international scope. People from Europe became interested in it right away. Um, you know, so we've had an ongoing dialogue between people in Europe, Canada, the U.S., all over. Um, and they, uh, the the network of pataphysicians and the network of avant guardians, uh, as we jokingly call ourselves sometimes, um, is really uh, surprisingly large, and the connections are very intense. 
people immediately identify with certain artists, you know, and it's a kind of uh, religion of the avant-garde, I think, that for us began with Shari, but branched out in many different directions, you know, and uh, I mentioned a few of them, but that, you know, David mm -hmm. could talk about that more too. Um, how are pataphysics, how would you separate pataphysics and, and avant-garde? Well, you know, pataphysics is one small phenomenon within the vast field of the avant-garde. Yeah. You know, um, it's an it's an, a fascinating field. You know, that has um, so many different aspects to it. The, in pataphysics, affects I think almost every discipline in some way or another, mm -hmm. whether that discipline knows it or not. And mm -hmm. uh, whereas the avant-garde is, um, we we deliberately, you know, this term, the avant-garde itself, is problematic. And a lot mm -hmm. of people argue with you, oh, the avant-garde is dead. The very term, you know, avant-garde is, it's, it's very modernist and formalist, and it's rooted in this old school, high modernism um, kind of canonization. And we don't see it that way at all. You know, we see the avant-garde as a, as a living concept, something that's happening right now, and that has been mm -hmm. happening yeah. from the beginning of the time when people started using that term in France in the 19th century, you know? So we see ourselves as part of a long line that, you know, you could draw from Jarry to Joyce to, you know, Pynchon to others in, you know, postmodern literature, uh, for, you know, on the visual arts side, um, the same kinds of lineages I mentioned, you know, Duchamp, Nauman, Bruton, um, there are thousands of other artists who I think could be connected to those people, all mm -hmm. of them in certain ways avant-garde. And, um, but we like that term avant-garde because it often makes people angry and it gets them uh, arguing with us in a productive way. <laughs> exactly. That's why we spent our first uh, symposium trying to locate yes. the avant-garde. We still haven't found it, but we're looking for it. Yes, we've also dislocated it sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. But then popped it back into place. <laughs> and just, and just, so indeed. Indeed. Let's travel down um, a road, John, that is an independent scholar. You look at sort of the intersection of politics and humor and, and psychology in your work. Uh, and Bruce Nauman is a favorite of yours yeah. um, that we could talk about all night. And I'm, um, and I'm positioned in front of one of his works right now. Um, oh. Let's, uh, one thing that, that I was reading today and was quite comforting and reminded me of being and seeing that exhibit uh, a couple of years ago and being in front of this piece of art. Um, the studio is as much about inertia, about waiting, as it is a, a record of when uh, he, Nauman, is there. And um, sp speak about that a little bit. Well, you know, Nauman is someone who's been deeply engaged with the idea of being. And I know that sounds absurdly abstract, but you know, what does it mean to be in general? What does it mean to be an artist? And you know, we discussed before that idea uh, that Nauman has always returned to that when he's in the studio, whatever he's doing must be art because he's an artist in his studio. And he's played with that idea in various ways. Sometimes, you know, Nauman will be in the studio and he'll start, he'll pick up a book. And I don't know if you've ever seen photographs of his studio mm -hmm. or a video of his studio. It's a kind of uh, fecund chaos. You know, mm -hmm. there are books stacked up, art materials, power tools, scrap wood, you know, things. He's just making stuff constantly and thinking constantly. But one of the things he does a lot in his studio is read. He's very engaged with language. And so language is one root of being for, for Nauman. The body is another root of being. You know, so the body in motion, the body in space, the body confined. Mm -hmm. uh, you have that uh, photo of me in the um, double cage piece, uh, perhaps. But um, that idea of the body being, you know, this, the only thing we have through which we can experience the world. And yet the body being so restrictive and so fragile and so vulnerable to the aggression and violence of others. And you know, for Nauman in the studio, he's always contemplating these things. He might pick up a Beckett uh, novel or a Beckett play and be thinking about that and make a piece out of that. He did a piece, a famous piece in the 60s called Beckett Walk, in which he tries to mimic 
the walk of a character uh, described by, by Beckett, um, who's very hunched over and kind of uh, in pain. And this, this has this odd loping, lurching walk. And it's, it's very comical and at the same time painful. And I think for Nauman, you know, he's in the studio, he's always exploring the human condition, exploring being, exploring how the body and how language shape human experience, how they constitute human experience. Mm -hmm. For you, when you, I'm thinking back to the photograph of you in the cage and, and um, you can describe a little bit more what that was like, but what, my experience of his work is one that is about being in relation to the work that he created, which is like, I mean, obvious, I guess, when we go to an art museum, but in this way, mm -hmm. much more um, visceral, if you will, like there's, uh, whether it's the multidimensional <laughs> nature of it, can you speak to how, how you experience the work? Is it primarily physical or, or do you experience it on a more cerebral level or both? It's, it's all of the above and everything in between. And I think one of the things that attract people to Nauman, and it's, it's, an, it's a unique taste. I don't think most people will uh, confront Bruce Nauman's work and love it immediately. But those who do and who stay with it I think find this incredible richness and variety in it. Um, he has the closest thing to, you know, the uh, Goethe concept of the Gesamt, the Wagnerian Goethe concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work mm -hmm. of art. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of absolute immersion in whatever experience it is that he's trying to create for you. And um, one of his signature pieces is uh, clown torture. I don't know if you experience yeah. that one in full, but um, it's, you know, you walk into this room, first of all, you hear the piece from usually very far away, you hear these screams and these weird psychotic laughs, and you hear these loud sounds, I mean, what is going on, you know, and you walk into this room where all the clown torture videos are playing simultaneously, and it's a kind of sensory mm -hmm. bombardment that is it's both hilarious and frightening at the same mm -hmm. time. And it's, it's, it's to me a quintessential experience of the absurd, you know, mm -hmm. it's just pulls that together. And that totality, that kind of, it's very visceral, mm -hmm. but it's very mm -hmm. intellectual too, because it makes you think, why do I feel the way I feel? What is it about this experience that's mm -hmm. making me feel this way? And why are clowns, when clowns, you know, are in situations where they seem to be feeling real pain, why does that, why is that so disturbing? Mm -hmm. And uh, clowning and humor, of course, are, you know, to me, crucial aspects of Nam's work. And I could talk about those things for the next four hours, but we don't have that time. <laughs> well, that's another show. Yeah. David, let me ask you, are you a, are you a Nauman enthusiast? Uh, well, I'm not as enthusiastic as John. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm on John's I'm bus. Fine. You might be on bus, David. Well, no, he... I, I'm a Naumanic depressive. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I'm attracted to Nauman's work, of course. I'm attracted to, I have very uh, a Catholic taste, so across the board. Uh, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it means uh, visually, I'm always, uh, you know, it's, it may be my uh, psychological makeup here, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just fascinated by the visual world. And if someone can articulate a vision, whether it's in neon, whether it's in stone or on canvas, or in word or other media, I'm interested. Is it overwhelming to you, David? Like when, when you are in there, do you get hit with sensory overload like like I do, like firing on all cylinders um, or does it come mostly through, uh, through a different channel? Well, I, you know, I, here I'll confess. I mean, I've been working in uh, uh, li uh, libraries, uh, major academic libraries for the last 30 odd years. So you, you sort of develop a kind of relation, uh, shall we say, a, a perspective, the individual versus, you know, the nine million volumes in the <laughs> building. Uh, you know what I mean? Or for example, at the University of Pennsylvania, where, where I work in the Kislak Center, uh, you know, we have over 17,000 linear feet of archives. <laughs> so, you know, you then break it down by who is the creator, how much stuff is there and so on and so forth. So um, having spent my entire 
most of my life since about 1966, uh, where I retreated. I found uh, I found Sukkur in uh, the local public library. I have always surrounded myself with books and had a relationship with books, whether it's um, in terms of working in a bookstore, collecting books, managing book libraries, acquiring collections. But my own, this is where, I, uh, like John, uh, who has his, his in, intense interest in Nauman and his philosophy and his aesthetic and place, um, I've, always, I've always been interested in, in avant-garde publishing. Mm -hmm. So um, whether you go back to the beginning of the century, the 20th century, and here Jerry, for example, is, is a kind of a model for what will emerge as um, with, with the pataphysic uh, aesthetic, he's printing books, printing magazines, and so on and so forth, articulating his philosophy of pataphysics. So as you extend that out uh, with the arrival of cubism and futurism and these isms uh, associated with that, of course, is a print culture, uh, a physical material expression of mm -hmm. what is going on in the minds and in the hearts and in the imaginations of the, the people who are creating the stuff. So uh, that in itself becomes a massive enterprise. Um, and as we were discussing earlier, uh, the University of Pennsylvania in 2008 acquired what was then the contents of the Gotham Bookmark, which is uh, the iconic North American um, modernist bookstore. And it evolved over, uh, it was in business for over almost 100 years. But what's interesting is that at the genesis of the store in the 1920s, Francis Stelloff, who is the founder of the store, born in, and lived and grew up in poverty in Saratoga Springs, by 1921 is making connections with Sylvia Beach, who's operating Shakespeare and Company in Paris. And she's making all kinds of interesting connections and linkages. And she becomes a major importer of the European avant-garde. And for a decade or so, she was the only, uh, she was among the only reliable sources for this new literature that was emerging on the scene, whether it be a little magazine or whether it be Ulysses and so on and so forth. They're, associated with modernism, of course, is censorship and so on and so forth. And she had her battles and trials with that. And I don't wanna get sidetracked, but uh, at any rate, um, we acquired in 2008, the, the, the contents of the Gotham bookmark, 200,000 books, uh, mm -hmm. several hundred linear feet of manuscript material. So with that, um, and going back to John's reference to Charles Bernstein, Charles had already been an incredible benefactor to uh, two of the Penn libraries with donating his little magazine and uh, broadside collection. So associated with the language poets and so on and so forth are a series of publications and some of the listeners uh, this evening and, viewer, and viewers this evening will, will probably be familiar with some of this literature. It goes on today. Uh, and the Gotham Bookmark was one of those centers where you could go mm -hmm. and reliably get a really cool recent issue of something. And in fact, she was a patron of the arts as well. And in the 1940s, she, um, she subsidized uh, the production of one of the most brilliant magazines that came out in the 40s. It was called View Magazine, which was a, a vehicle for American surrealism. And um, Duchamp, in fact, published, uh, there was a special Duchamp issue. Um, only a hundred issue, uh, uh, issues were produced at that time. It's a very valuable magazine. So there's the notion of collecting, there's the notion of production, the notion mm -hmm. of amassing and processing and making the stuff available. So I'm happy to say that we have processed almost all of the Gotham Bookmark and it's accessible to users when we reopen the library. Uh, it can be searched online and so on and so forth. But it tells a fascinating story about a moment, uh, not a moment, but several decades of 
uh, artistic production in North America and Europe. I, David, when I think about your job and coming to work every day, it strikes me that you, it's like being in charge of this most wonderful uh, collection of children that are so very valuable and, yes. and who it, it, I imagine there to be, uh, there's so many ghosts in there for you as a visceral <laughs> way well, of- um, uh, Yes, there are ghosts and you know who the, <laughs> In, in a certain respect, um, that was one of the, the ghosts are in fact the traces that are left in the books of the owners who own them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have volumes going, you know, we have books that go back to the middle ages, right up to the present, uh, fragile pamphlets uh, with some fantastic poetry on it. Uh, but who owned the book? That's the fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There who are, had this before? Are uh, there lots of notes and things inside? Are there, there you know, how? Uh, Penn has been very, uh, very innovative. Uh, I should say the Kislak Center has been very innovative in terms of provenance research, mm -hmm. that is ownership uh, and tracing, um, you know, the, the path and life of a book. Um, that was one of the fun things about going through the Gotham Bookmark collection because you, because many of the books um, were used books in addition to having uh, trade copies for sale of new books. So yeah, dedications, all kinds of cool things, markings and so on and so forth. Of course, these become more valuable depending on who the owner was. So, you know, if you have uh, a James Joyce's copy of X, you've got a really mm -hmm. valuable book. So um, with his annotations. Um, Did you find really valuable? Uh, within the Gotham, within the Gotham, uh, num uh, lots of signed editions because uh, it was the habit for many authors like John Updike to walk past the shop and they he'd be called into the store and uh, John, here's your new book. Uh, can you sit down and sign a couple of hundred copies? And he would do so. Uh, but there were some very interesting ar archival pieces that we discovered that. Uh, that have uh, interesting provenance and so on. Um, particularly the writers, uh, Mary and Pedrick Collum, uh, who were founders of the James Joyce Society with, along with Stelloff in the 1940s. Uh, some great uh, literary references to Ireland and Joyce and modernism, it's really cool. I wonder how you don't get sidetracked during your day. Do you, you know? get sidetracked? No, yeah, I would be sidetracked. Be sidetracked. Oh, I haven't seen that. I need to pull that off the shelf. Very and, um, I, have, just very quickly, you know, we have uh, Theodore Dreiser's library. So if you want to explore the mind uh, of a, a great American author through his library, you're able to do that. You could actually go on to the go into the uh, pen catalog and type in Dreiser Library and you get the 3000 titles in the library. So there's a way of interacting intellectually with the content, it's really cool, mm -hmm. it's really cool. And of course, there's always the prospect of new stuff, like for example, the James Bruton archive that we acquired mm -hmm. um, at the time, around 2016, thanks to Emily, mm -hmm. Emily Bruton. Um, and, he, and Jim's stuff is the cornerstone for our PASC archive within the context of the Kislak Center. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully that will, we'll, you know, we'll get John's stuff over time and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and uh, we'll seek other, other, uh, other materials as well. Before I wanna, I want, definitely wanna move, move to the PASC's upcoming symposium and, yeah. and talk to you both about the many artists that are gonna be um, mm -hmm. that are going to be presenting there. But mm -hmm. David, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how, you know, the, the comfort uh, as, as John is drinking his, I'm going to assume it's tea, John, in, uh, in your, in your uh, or your scotch <laughs> and, um, and in, in yes. front of the fireplace. And I'm thinking how warm, I don't know, just how important books are to our being and a place like the Gotham Book Mart where people would come together and make these amazing mm -hmm. connections and just be full of life and okay and you know here we are and i wonder with the loss of a place like that how how does that hole get filled 
Well, it's a comp, you know, it's a, it, it it's a, That's a whole other show, but well, it is that we, yeah, let's talk about it at another time. And um, I mean, look, we're at a, a very uh, critical moment in um, information history. Uh, and, you know, the, we all have one of these now, you know, we all have an iPhone, there are billions of them. And we're, we're migrating slowly to a new mode of interacting with information. And, you know, the vision for the internet really was conceived 75 years ago, uh, maybe even longer with a notion of this, of, of, a, of a ethereal space. But, uh, you know, there, there, there are still, the, 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 as much as we've migrated to the online world and we can talk about that at length. There's still a passion for the physical object, the book. And, uh, you know, what did I just read? Obama, Obama's new memoir, uh, the first day sales, 890,000 mm -hmm. volumes, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Just the whole experience is so right. tactile and so uh, sensory. So the book, is, I don't feel that the book itself is in danger. We can quibble mm -hmm. about that and discuss it. The physical object will continue to be printed because there's still enough interest within the culture to support it. As for wider and larger trends, that's another matter. Uh, but you know, the book has been around for five, at least in Europe, it's been around for about over a thousand years as we consider the codex. Um, there are millions and millions and millions of copies of books so I don't need to think, I don't think we need to worry about them disappearing. So we'll still have access to it. Yeah, it I think, was. I think the danger is, if there is a danger, and this is my last point, um, th that um, generationally, I don't, I don't want to sound like an old fart here, but, um, you know, generationally, I think as we might, as, as I look at my little nephews, grand nephews and so on, they're all holding variants of an iPad or a phone. And that's what they're going to uh, learn how to adapt to and use. Um, perhaps uh, many families don't even have books any longer. They don't buy books. Sure. So there are cultural factors in this as well, but I think the book itself is secure. Uh, and the artisans that are producing beautiful books is just amazing. Just yeah. amazing. So yeah. for me, it's less about, uh, sorry, about the, about the, the book experience, the book itself and the experience of being in that place, Yeah, that, that gathering, that, but, you know, all, all of that. I hear, I hear what you're saying. I mean, that's, lot, that's the big question. I, su I suppose a last comment would be if you, um, I don't know when I'll, I'll ever get back again, but, you know, one of the great book cities in the world is Paris. And so if, if you are, if you do have the means and you want to take a book holiday, I recommend going to Paris uh, because virtually on every street there's a bookstore. Mm -hmm. So the book is still alive in Europe. Yeah. Um, and um, I think to a lesser extent in let's say North America, certainly in America, I think the book itself, although millions of copies are millions of 800,000 or a million books are published every year, uh, it's a different story and mm -hmm. we've lost our bookstores because we've all, and I do too, you buy online. Mm. Well, yeah. I, would, I would dare say that buying a book now, a paper book, a physical book is an avant-garde act. It could very well be, John, I, you know. Well, I'm it's a... counter, it's counterculture as well. And it's <laughs> counterculture among young people as well as old fogies like us. Yeah. The yeah. students I work with every day, a day does not pass when a, a digital native, you know, 18 year old, 22 year old mm -hmm. doesn't say to me, I'm so sick of reading online. I'm mm -hmm. so yeah. sick of PDFs. I love sitting down with a book and I'm not making that up to make myself feel good. That's what no, they no, say. You hear that a lot. Every yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, John, Let's let's move back into or move forward into the upcoming symposium um, and um, let's go there. 
yeah. and I'll let you pick up the ball. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead, John. Sure. Um, you know, we of course um, couldn't resist the absurd as the topic for 2020. Uh, you know, it's just it's been written all over 2020 in so many different ways. And uh, yeah. Do you remember when yeah. the word absurd, you know, maybe 10 years ago, if it was used, it had a very specific meaning. And then about Absolutely. five yeah. years ago, and people were saying to us, well, wow, your time has really come for your theater company. And I was like, oh, no, yeah. oh, no, there's nothing we can do that even comes close to what's happening. So it's just funny yeah. how it's now a word that is just right. well, covers everything. Yeah, to me, I go back to when um, the orange one was first elected, and I will not speak the name. Um, and you and I had a discussion about how the character of the orange one corresponded almost point by point to the character of Per Ubu, mm -hmm. right? Ubu the original play. And you know, we discussed that at that time. And um, it really, it, as history has played out, the absurdity of the reality has been so overwhelming that it really does make you think about the relationship between avant-garde art and life. Jari, in a way, wrote the orange one <laughs> for a hundred years before the orange one came into being. And that to me is just, it's remarkable, the power of avant-garde art, not only to speak about its own time, but to talk about the eternal verities, <laughs> the, the, re, the mm -hmm. eternal return of certain human characteristics, and one of them being this deep absurdity of modern life, uh, modern from you know 1896 to, to 2020, it goes on and on. And um, to you know that's why it, this year's symposium was a, a, a no-brainer extraordinaire. We had to talk about the absurd. It, uh, and so, you know, this, of course, brought you in immediately um, and many other artists who have taken different um, views, scholars who have taken different views of the absurd. And, you know, in the, um, in formulating this, you know, we talked about there's so many different ways in which you can discuss the absurd. You can talk about it from a philosophical viewpoint. Uh, and you talk about Camus, you can talk about it from a theatrical viewpoint and talk about any number of uh, theater of the absurd artists. And you could talk about it from the visual arts viewpoint and say, okay, let's begin with the grand master of the absurd in Dada and Surrealism that we all deify here in Philadelphia, Duchamp, and then take that through, like I said, these numerous lineages to the present day. Um, the political artists, you know, when I think about, I've got, I'm gonna reach for a book here, an actual, paper book, but um, that's uh, Theodore Harris's uh, Our Flesh and Flames. If, I don't know if you can actually read that, Our Flesh and Flames. Uh, but this, this book to me is so timely and Theodore's work is so timely. He points out the absurdity of the actions of politicians and of society as a whole, of our culture as a whole, which routinely seems to have a talent for saying that that which is evil is good. <laughs> and yeah. is, he has so many witty and insightful and really bitingly satirical pieces <coughs> I just love. And that's part of why we want to have, um, you know, Theodore uh, really get more deeply involved with PASC. He'll be, he and I will be talking about his work at the symposium. That's one of the things um, obviously I'm looking forward to because it involves me. No, uh, <laughs> because it involves Theodore's work and, and it's a, an incredible doorway to the avant-garde in America. Theodore's collaboration in this book with Amory Baraka, you know, one of the leading poets of the 20th century into the 21st century, he died in 2013. Um, Baraka wrote the captions for Theodore's works in this right. particular book done in 2008, but reissued recently. And that's when I, uh, I recently got it. Um, but that to me, you know, it says so much about what does the absurd mean? Well, it means so many different things. You know, it isn't locked into early 20th century philosophy in France. It's not locked into the theater of the absurd, but both of those topics are fascinating and worthy of exploration. What's happening right now, when you look at a, an art, artist like Theodore Harris, 
you say, oh, this is a new direction mm -hmm. in which the absurd is developing. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, to me, he's just one example of many. And David can talk about others at this point. I'll hand off the ball to you. <laughs> well, uh, before, can I just ask a question there, David, before we get into that? I just, you had mentioned earlier, David, when PASC first formed, it was a group of explorers, if you will. Yeah. Uh, you, you described it as explorers. And I, I do... Um, is there, is there, do you think what draws the explorers together is that we're experiencing or sharing a, in a bit like the way you might engage with a Nauman exhibit, you're experiencing yeah. a truth that sometimes you wonder if you're the only, it's the existential challenge that, that am I the only person that is disoriented by these politics as everyone else? Do I really live on this earth right now? Do you think that that, that is what pulls the explorer together? Well, <clears throat> I think some of us like to, uh, you know, I mean, there, we, the, just to kind of flip it on its head, I suppose, uh, we have the option of uh, sailing on the ship of fools, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and perhaps we're still uh, waiting for our, uh, our ship to come to, to port uh, at the present time. Uh, I think one of the goals of, you know, Certainly, and I, I'm, not, I'm not being nostalgic here, but with the Pataphysics uh, Symposium, it brought together a large community of like-minded people. Um, some traveled from afar, uh, and I think it's that moment of recognition when um, you go to an event like that symposium, just like our uh, previous symposiums in the Kislak Center, is that uh, relationships are formed, like-minded or controversial, never oppositional or oppositional. And I think that that's uh, where the satisfaction lies in the fact that we're, um, as a community of practitioners, uh, academics and um, archivists, librarian types. So we've got, we're drawing on several communities. And I think that that's, that's for me, what is the, 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 the joy of the outcome, which is to bring us all together. And I think that that's, uh, I think that that's one of the roles of PASC uh, in terms of just connecting people together. You know, who would have, uh, going back to Theodore, I mean, I, you know, we kind of bumped into Theodore <laughs> and, you know, we've established a relationship with him, a, a good working relationship. He's one example, but we have other members of the community as well. So it's all good. Do you think that the that the that the like you say you bump you bumped into him? Is it a it is it just do, over time? Do things do, so the politics that we've been dealing with for the last four years present us new opportunities and challenges to see things in an absurd way? Does that yeah. that open? And I like that word bumped into when yeah. you know. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this question, but the idea that do the times change what makes, John, you mentioned before, avant-garde is just now, it's happening, it's going, it's it's here, and it just shifts and moves a little as we move forward. I mean, I mean, the last four years certainly presented lots of opportunities. Yeah, I think that part of what happened in the last four years was it was it brought about a consciousness of the um, importance of the avant-garde, that the avant-garde does speak to issues that matter. And when I was reading um, more of Amory, uh, Amory Baraka's work um, and uh, discussing it with Theodore, we came across a poem from 2013 where um, Baraka talks about there are still Nazis in America, right? He thought they were all gone, but there are still Nazis in, right. in America. 2013, okay, that's the year he, he died. Um, fast forward to 2020, what are we seeing, right? We're seeing fans of the orange man, right? Who happen to be white nationalists um, chanting the <clears throat> slogans of, of anti-Semitism and racism. We see uh, neo-Nazis in Germany carrying banners of the orange one. Yeah. Is his prowess. And 
that to me, you know, for Baraka to be speaking about that in his poetry, which many people would say, oh, well, you're reading Baraka. You're one of those eggheads who's removed from the real world. You don't really, yeah. you're talking to other poets. No, he's talking to this country, you know, seven years ago and telling yeah. us, here's what's still going on in your country. Here's yeah. what's still happening. There are still Nazis here <laughs> and mm -hmm. they're not all gone. And we have yeah. seen that. Um, there are people who really support that ideology in this country and that the poet speaking to us from what many people think of as that isolated ivory tower is actually right there at the heart of the culture. Right. Speaking mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. what we need to think about now. Well, the, if I may, uh, Tina, if just very quickly, mm -hmm. if I can yeah, just a, a thought. Um, I, you know, I think if you think of the recent controversy uh, regarding Philip Guston and his, uh, the exhibition that was doing a big retrospective exhibition that has been uh, installed because of the interpretation of images that, are, that were used by Guston in his work. And they are controversial. They are KKK images, which are being, you know, this is where we get into the absurdity of interpretation. Yeah. Because the original intent was to uh, not to uh, affirm, yeah. but to, I think, to a certain extent, shock us mm -hmm. into a kind of a recognition that this is a psychic, social, cultural reality. So now we're debating what they are, those symbols. And it becomes, again, the, this isn't as bad as, let's say, Joy's making sexual references in oh, Ulysses at the time, which would be considered perhaps, and I'm being a bit, you know, supercilious here by saying today that they seem silly, but in terms of concrete representations of hate and organized hate in society, it becomes a jumble now. And now we don't know what the hell we're talking about. And also it's because people don't know how to recognize satire anymore. Exactly, mm -hmm. precisely. Gustin was satirizing, he was mocking the KKK. Yeah and exposing this residual KKK mentality in, that's in the US, whether you're overtly or covertly uh, identifying with it. And you know that to me, this piece recently that Theodore did, um, it's got a wonderful caption, um, Philip Guston's return to figuration put impure thoughts in the minds of Kramer and Greenberg. <laughs> Kramer and Clement Greenberg, the foremost. We're not gonna have time to unpack all of that, but I just love how the avant-garde at this minute is constantly connecting all the lines of history mm -hmm. and politics yeah. and culture and showing, revealing what the hypocrisy of our culture tries to conceal. You know, yeah. especially in America, we love to think of ourselves as that exceptional nation, the leader in all things when in fact we, like many other nations, can fall into really regressive practices and still right. have you know, many um, deeply rooted problems that we don't want to recognize. That's right. Is it a uh, toilet or a work of art, our mother? Right. <laughs> I did think about Ubu um, yes. this week when I was watching whichever the, you know, whichever the news story was with the, you know, the press conference with the black mm -hmm. hair dye coming down the face. Uh, it reminded me of the of the of whoever the henchman was on the other side of Uber. Oh, wait, like, oh, what have I got Lord, here? Lord, <laughs> what's happening now? Um, John, you said before, uh, and I want to make sure I look over and get get uh, questions too. Um, and to remind everyone that we have it in the chat box there, but visit the PASC website, pascarts.org uh, for information on this free event, one to four on uh, December the 4th of Friday, it's a Friday. Uh, just need a Zoom reservation for that. Um, and we'll be looking at Theodore Harris's work and a number of artists, Cheryl Harper and Orkin Tierney and uh, many people that are listed um, yeah. in the chat box. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be a really fun afternoon. Uh, John, you said something earlier about I, if I'm quoting you right, the avant-garde just makes people mad. Like um, times, that, yeah, that yeah. word. I, and why do you think that is? Is it well, just ideas? This goes, that... back, this goes back to early 20th century history and the politics of art when yeah. early Marxist communist regimes like Stalin, you know, came along and said, all art 
must serve the community. In other words, all art must do what I, Joseph Stalin, wanted to do, which is to glorify the Soviet Union. That's just one version. Many other dictators have used art in that way. It's art's another form of propaganda. And so at that time, there was a tendency, and this is by no means universal, but there were some critics who started to say, if art is not talking about social problems directly, it's not worthy of really being given attention. And some of the avant-garde art, especially some of the more absurd art, um, Duchamp was accused of this many times, you know, that he was sort of disappearing into that ivory tower again. You know, this, mm -hmm. these are all just a bunch of inside jokes. They don't really pertain to anything in the real yeah. world. And so the avant-garde started to get labeled in a very unfair way, I think, as being disengaged from mm -hmm. politics and society. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we had the symposium um, called uh, uh, Apolitical My Ars, <laughs> um, with a you know play yeah. on uh, Ars and Ars, Ars Poetica. Um, and um, we you know wanted to bring to the forefront the, the notion that actually the history of the avant-garde is one that is deeply political and social mm -hmm. and constantly challenging socio-political norms. Yeah, I think back in 2014, as you're speaking, when we did uh, Eugene Ionesco's Rhinoceros, yeah. and right. this was even before um, the last four years, and it just seemed so prescient and 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 not distant or or library tower at all. It's this is what's happening in your community right down the street from where you are. Yeah. Um, let me just see, I want to see down, oh, someone's suggesting a PASC magazine here. We need to have a magazine. Um, and David, uh, comment about your curating uh, the ex an exhibition, uh, ex exhibition of Theodore Harris's work for 2022, 2023. We're hoping, we're hoping. Yeah. Well, we're let's, hoping. yes, yeah, so that's on the, on the charts as well. Yes. Um, uh, I guess, um, John, if, if you were to, um, I, I'm going to go back to our friend Bruce Nauman uh, again, sure. um, uh, because as I'm looking ahead of me and I'm, I'm, I'm remembering standing in front of this exhibit and I'm seeing the words behind me and how much that neon was just, it, it brought me to tears really. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 so the picture I'm in front of right now, which if I've got I, a 100 live and die is the right. name of this specific yeah, work, but good. these two black figures in front of me, I took this photo. So they were, they were two people watching this. People couldn't, I don't know if they could or couldn't, but they weren't moving. Yeah. Oh, they were just, I, it was as though the electricity had sort of amplified them. Right. And right. I just couldn't, couldn't go away from it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is visceral. Oh yeah, absolutely. And at this, it's visceral, and at the same time, it's very cognitive and psychological. Um, the the phrases, the one hundred phrases, you know, these variations, mm -hmm. these permutations, with a verb such as you know, kiss and live, kiss and die. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you you if you let that resonate, those that pairing, that's just one of them. You know, laugh mm -hmm. and live, laugh and die, touch and live, touch and die. We think of today, especially in the midst of COVID, right? Breathe and die, touch and die. Um, these kinds of, this is just of this moment, but those are universal phrases throughout human history. Yeah. Those actions and thinking of how our actions can result in life or death um, in one way or another, whether it's physical death or kind of you know, psychological or emotional death. Uh, that to me is uh, just one example of how, you know, Nauman and other avant-garde artists can take something so simple as just words, right? Put them yeah. for us in a unique format. In this case, neon. It's you know, it's a large neon wall piece, and bring a, a freshness and power to those simple words that you never could imagine. And it really is a mesmerizing piece. It just stops people in their tracks, and um, it's it's amazing how enduring so many of his pieces are. That's you know part of why, obviously, I I've always enjoyed his work so much and have study. Mm -hmm. It will be interesting to revisit or to see it again in light of what we've all been through. Um, yes, sure. Because it is, it is work that really feels like 
you're bringing your soul to the table to interact with him in a way that is totally in, in which I guess you could argue is all art, but this feels particularly like mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. speaking to me through me though. And in light of the pandemic and just how much time we've been spending in isolation, his work seemed to, as you, as you spoke about earlier, really focus on that yeah. sense of, of yeah. ourselves in relation to our bodies and in, in relation to the world. Um, um, well, gentlemen, it is now 5.55 and uh, David, I guess I'll, I'll throw it back to you just for a, a, final, um, a, final, a final thought or two. Mine, mine to you would be, please, please be on the, the triumvirate of, of Bruce Nauman uh, bus when we go next time up to New York. I will. <laughs> We're making you Even go. If I have to socially distance. <laughs> you bring a book, okay? And then you can. Is there anything, David, you'd like to add about the symposium uh, coming uh, up? I think that um, I'm, I'm. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Tina, uh, for giving us mm -hmm. this opportunity to uh, speak to you through your vehicle today, and to the folks who've uh, who've zoomed in. Um, you know, we've we've had our various ambitions over the years, but I think. Uh, we've got a, a tightly knit program that I think will uh, excite everyone and get people thinking about the orange one in retreat and um, uh, examples of some pretty cool things that are going on in Philadelphia right now. John? Well, I just hope everyone can uh, make it virtually. Um, in spirit and uh, mind to the symposium. And we've, got, we've all got uh, thousands of things to talk about um, and I look forward to engaging with everyone. So thanks to everyone. Thank you, Tina. Oh, and you're so very welcome. Ended. Thank you. I've been privileged to, to be on this, on just the very sidelines of, of the work that you all are doing. And it's, it's stimulating to me as a theater artist and uh, to be engaged with uh, so many other disciplines, people working and thinking, it really does stimulate the work that we're all doing, um, and particularly given the time we're in. So I really look forward to being there and yeah. to talking more with you both. Absolutely. And um, and I wish you a very safe uh, week and Thanksgiving ahead. Thank you, David. Thank Thanks you, John. So Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bye. Erica and Bob. See you yes. soon. Yes. Take care. Bye-bye, right. bye, David. And thanks to everyone who tuned in uh, for this conversation. And I do hope over the Thanksgiving weekend, you'll join us next Saturday on the 28th when the Reverend Josh Blakesley will be with us here. Josh is combining some interesting talents. Uh, he's got a degree in theater from Northwestern and a, uh, his master's in divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. And he is the founder of The Welcome Project, which is doing all kinds of exciting work. We'll send you an email giving you all of the links and uh, I hope you'll tune in. It's really gonna be a fun conversation about the ways in which theater and gathering communities and uplifting communities um, in need in our area are happening in your very backyard. So from everybody here at the IRC, have a very safe Thanksgiving, however you choose to celebrate it, keep your masks on, and we look forward to seeing you next Saturday if you can make it. Thanks and have a great Thanksgiving.